So our keynote speaker today is Dr. Kate Donahue. She is one of the board members here at VINS, which is a pretty cool connection. And she is also an anthropologist. Does anybody know what anthropology is? I remember cool. when I was in high school and I was looking into universities and I had to check off all these things that I was interested in. And I said to my mother, what's anthropology? And she goes, oh, you would love anthropology. <laughs> anthropology is the study of humans. Um, and so anthropology is the study of humans. Anthro meaning man, apology meaning the study of. Um, the study of humans can go in so many different directions. And Kate has demonstrated that with various different types of research over her career. Um, but what she's going to talk about today is environmental anthropology. So how humans interact with the environment and what we can do with that. So with no further ado, I would like to hand over the microphone and please a uh, round of applause for our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Can you hear me back there? No? Sort of. Shall I shout? like I'm angry, as somebody said yesterday. Shout like I'm angry. Hello, how are you today? It is a beautiful day. We're blessed to be here, actually, on such a gorgeous day. I understand that occasionally it has rained during these presentations, and I can imagine it would be pretty wet. However, today's absolutely a gift. So I'm going to talk with you today about many things, actually. Uh, me, I'm a little embarrassed to talk about me, because I know about me, but, you know, and you know about you, but I'm interested in learning more about you folks. But I have a degree in anthropology. I was an English major in college. Uh, I'll have to say right here, I was sort of an indifferent student as I was a when I was young, I would get bored. I would pull out a book and read it during class. Sorry to say that. I hope that's not a bad example for some of you. But I discovered anthropology. Uh, I had an uncle who was an anthropologist who worked in Italy. I thought that was very cool. Um, I've been able to take students from Plymouth State to France. We even went to Tanzania and brought students your ages to Tanzania and Africa. It was wonderful. And then I've done work in Alaska, elsewhere in the US, and with sustainable recreational boating. Kind of worried about that shrink wrap that's on boats in the winter. You know what happens to it when you take it off? And does it go into the dumpsters? There's a lot of shrink wrap out there. On hay bales also, which we've seen all those big white balls of white hay covered with whiteness. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk a bit about the hydrosphere. I had to look it up myself and make sure I knew what I was talking about, and how water affects where we live. We know that happens. Uh, then I'll go into why I chose anthropology, and what I do as an anthropologist, and how my work connects to where we live. And what you can do to help, and I think you're already figuring that out with your projects. So, life in the hydrosphere. How much water in the world is there? As it turns out, it's a lot. 70% of the Earth's surface is water covered. 97% of that water is in the ocean, oceans. And the rest is all around us. It's right down over the edge over here. It's a vernal pool right behind you over there. So it's, it's all, all around us. And I wonder what our place is in this world full of water. How much water is inside us? This is kind of an eye opener for me. Our brains are 95% water. Our lungs, 90%. So it's a good reminder to drink our water <laughs> because it is really important. And I know you've had experience with water. You live in this area. 
Um, many of you are Vermonters. Any New Hampshireites here? All Vermont? New Hampshire. And so we know that Vermont and New Hampshire have had major flooding. It's probably impacted you in some ways. It only has me, where I live in Heartland, Vermont. And we've been reading about what happened in Montpelier. You know, the state capitol was flooded. They've been without a post office for months and months. And it's had a big impact even on our local roads. So my neighbor had his culvert washed out completely. He was stuck on this back road, can't get out. And it took a couple of days before he could leave his house. And I don't know if you've had that happen to you at all. No? Good thing. The road just up above me, another culvert gone. It was an eight-foot hole in the, in the road, actually. And so some Amazon drivers were coming through thinking they could get across. No way. So I know we've all been affected by either too much or not enough. I don't know if any of your wells have run, run dry. Um, I sometimes worry about that, but then I know we've got too much water and sometimes I have too much water in my cellar. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. Um, if your roads got washed out, uh, it, you know, it just impacts us all the time. And I began to think, well, what can I add to this discussion? You already know a lot about what's happening to you and how water's been affecting you. But I started out thinking of how I grew up uh, <clears throat> a small farm, Massachusetts, sheep and chickens, you know, who cares? However, I found a spear point in the brook right behind me. I was about eight years old, and I brought it with me today if you want to see it. It was small, maybe broken at the base, but it's a real thing. So what does this have to do with anthropology? Well, I got interested in archaeology, partly because of that spear point. And I used to go to a museum in Cambridge, Mass, at Harvard. I would just walk myself. I was about 10. And I'd walk over to the museum by myself, just wander through the museum. I thought, you know, that was really, really very fun. And I also got interested in physical anthropology. I don't know if you know Jane Goodall. She has worked in Tanzania with chimpanzees. <clears throat> She's now a... Uh, sort of uh, a person very much involved with preserving nature, keeping nature wild, and helping out the cause of chimpanzees, many of whom have been in cages, and making sure, you know, that they get to have a more normal life rather than being the objects of study. On the other hand, there's Coco the gorilla, who maybe you've heard of. She's not alive anymore. But she apparently used sign language to communicate with her keepers, her handlers. She had a small kitten that she used to love. She called it All Ball. She gave it a name, actually, and was devastated when All Ball died. <laughs> Coco, apparently, she's quite large. The girl is pretty big. And Coco would sometimes sit on the edge of her. She lived on a trailer, actually. And she would sit on the edge of her sink like this. Now you can imagine, when you lean on the sink too heavily, sometimes the sink falls away from, the, from the, where it's attached to. And when she was asked, did you do that, Coco? Coco said, no, not me. So she knew how to lie, which is maybe a, a human trait. Human language is part of linguistic anthropology. The gestures we use, um, how we think is determined often by the language we have. Perhaps you've heard that it's said that native people <clears throat> up in the far north um, have many, many words for snow. We got a lot of words for snow because it affects us a lot. And we have a lot of words for water, you know, like dirty water, fast water, flooding water, drought. You know, we, if you think about it, you could come up with a lot of words having to do with water because it's important to us. And what I do more of is cultural anthropology. And so this is a group of people in <clears throat> Eastern Africa, the Maasai. Don't know if you know about them. They, the young men in particular are known for doing wonderful dance. And if I try to do it, <laughs> believe me, it'll look kind of silly. 
because they are, they can, they can leap, they can jump. They are wonderful basketball players, actually. And many of them would choose not to be basketball players. They really actually want to live as they live herding cattle in East Africa. So how do you do cultural anthropology? Basically, ask questions about how people live, which sounds invasive, you know. Knock, knock on the door, I want to hear how you live. Well, that's not how it often works, but people really do want to talk about themselves. You know, if you're interested in them, they're kind of happy to be able to tell you how they live. And so I've been able to go to Alaska, <clears throat> up to the far north, and to, sorry, research a bunch of photos taken in 1886 when the Coast Guard cutter went up to Alaska. And I got to talk to people who were the grandchildren, great-grandchildren of the people living in 1886. And they could identify some of their forebears in the photographs that I brought. I'll show you where Point Hope is. It's way up here, right there above the Arctic Circle. People live hunting whales and seals and, let me think what else, fish. Um, who else would live up there in the Arctic Circle? Caribou? Anything else? Bears. Yes, actually, I went walking on the beach and by myself. It was pretty quiet. And I looked down and I saw this big bear print on the beach. Uh, there was some walrus there, dead walrus. Somebody had cut the head off the walrus. Uh, I think for the tusks, they use the tusks to carve. Uh, when I got back to this place where I was staying, one of the people there living with, you know, staying with me said, you're really lucky you didn't run into Yogi Bera, bear. And fortunately, I didn't, <laughs> but he was around, or she. Shrink wrap. I kind of dropped the NG, didn't I, there? Shrink wrapping, wrapping. Oh, well. It's used on boats. Don't know if you see boats that are covered with this white plastic. But again, the hay bales that we talked about earlier, those are all covered with this plastic, white plastic. And you can imagine, when you look at the fields around us, how much shrink wrap there is and what happens to it. And a lot of it goes into dumpsters. It turns out you can take the shrink wrap and make it into, like those white plastic lawn chairs a lot of us have out there, or <clears throat> jersey barriers, you know, the kind of thing when they're working on a road and there's these big barriers you have to avoid to stop you from going off the road or into their construction site. They fill those up sometimes with uh, water or sand, and those could be made from this, <clears throat> from this shrink wrap. Back to the water. So this was the brook that I found the, the spear point in, and I realized that my life's been defined by water. I moved to Vermont with my parents when I was nine, and the first place we lived was West Hartford, Vermont. It was called Brook Farm. Moved to Heartland, Sugar Brook Farm. Moved to Heartland again, Katie Brook. So something about brooks in my life has been really important. And I think you might begin to think about that too. You know, what's important to you outside, near you, that you care about? Basically caring about is what counts. I live where two brooks collide, basically. And so here's Lulls Brook, which is in Heartland. And here's Katie Brook, again in Heartland. And my house is right there. I haven't been flooded yet, but our road's been flooded out. And those two brooks flood. Behind me are wetlands. And this is where I'm kind of heading right now to talk to you about. I was there just on Sunday, it was raining, it was beautiful, it was wet, it's okay. Katie Brook is one place right over near Woodstock, South Woodstock, and it's a migratory 
trail for a lot of animals, like bobcat and bear. Uh, we can name a few more. But the ones right there somehow deposited a tire. Not the bear. It was humans. How did it get there? I don't know why it was there. It was further up the stream. And then that July storm last year, it moved it about a quarter of a mile down the road. And that's a heavy tire. And I'm trying to figure out how do we get that out of the wetlands there, because it really, you know, probably shouldn't be there. But there's a vernal pool with wood frogs, spring peepers, salamanders. We've got trilliums, trillia, trilliums or trillia? <laughs> I don't know. I should know. And there's an old beaver pond, and you can see that there are many birds that live there. Right now, they've been coming back. So, you know, it's geese and ducks and common yellow throats. Those are the ones that go witchety witchety, if you ever hear them out there. Uh, Red winged blackbirds, you probably know. And spring peepers. So, what can you do to help? And so, I'm wondering what your projects are today, actually, having to do with water, perhaps, many of them. Anybody want to say what you've been doing? Yes. Um, I the vernal pool ecosystems. Vernal pools. I'm so glad. I'm sure the vernal pool creatures are happy, too. Yes. And I'm sorry, what? OK, excellent. Well, maybe you could help me identify some of those egg masses that I've got. Was there a hand back here? Anyone else? What are you working on? Dunk. What have you been? <laughs> Streams. <laughs> Streams. <laughs> good. Gum's good, too. <laughs> Keeps life flowing. <laughs> Anybody else? What have you been doing? What are the projects that are hanging over here? No? No. <laughs> no? Do I see a hand? It's okay. Listen, I'm nervous at talking with you. You can be nervous at talking with me. So. I think they're still sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I bet there's some good projects right over there that you worked really hard on. Yeah. Yeah. And those fertile pools are going to be really happy. Um, how many of you participated in Green Up Day? Anybody go out there and pick up trash? Anyone? I recommend doing that. Maybe treat every day as a Green Up Day because there's always somebody throwing something out there. <clears throat> We have someone who likes to drink Foster's beer. I don't know if you know Foster's. It's a big blue can. <laughs> and this Foster's guy, he starts drinking down somewhere in Heartland. And by the time he reaches the farm right before where we, we live, out it goes. Yeah. There are hundreds of Foster's cans out there. It's probably, you know, and it's a big can. Sometimes it's a big can. <laughs> yeah. OK, so how do I take anthropology? I see it as a way to study the world, you know, to do science in a, in a sort of a disciplined way, but I'm not very disciplined. And then I like to sort of talk about how people make stories up about where they live and the water that's around them, or the land that's around them, or the birds right here that we hear right now all talking. I don't know what they're saying. But I wish I knew. Yeah, I want to be Dr. Doolittle. If you've ever known of Dr. Doolittle, he could talk to animals. <laughs> but what I do find solace in is something like poetry. Helps me think about the world in a way that makes me feel better, because I know a lot of things aren't great in this world right now, as you probably know, too. And so I'm giving honor to Wendell Berry, who wrote about nature 
in a beautiful way. I guess I'll break a rule and read it because I just like the way it sounds. The Peace of Wild Things. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and I'm free. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.